turn your camera back on, okay? Have I got my camera off? Yeah, you do. No. I, I so see you. Oh, back there. The, okay. No, you're there. Sorry about that, okay. Dean. I thought I disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> so we are live and we are yeah. ready to begin the meeting, Mr. Chair. Thanks, everyone, for uh, setting aside your uh, late afternoon. We'll try to get through an agenda efficiently. I will begin by calling the meeting to order and say that uh, uh, this is the last meeting for three of our longtime members. Janet Brigger will be retiring, Janet, and uh, thank you for all your dedication to task and bringing such excellent presentations month that, or quarter after quarter after quarter. We'll be uh, uh, missing those. And uh, Harry Bennett has retired, and I understand he's smiling on our main street in Canmore somewhere. <laughs> uh, 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 Harry's an uh, extra uh, born boy and raised uh, here and lives in Canmore and uh, has served uh, his uh, place of residency, life place of residency, ma amazingly well. To my surprise and disappointment, Jonathan Moser is not with us tonight and won't be in the future. So he's moving on to other things. And uh, again, uh, 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 a presence and a skill set that will be missed in this organization. Uh, Moving on to the approval of the agenda. The agenda is before you. Uh, and is, are there any additions? Uh, I do, Mr. Chair. Uh, can you tell me what it is, Paul? I can't see you. Oh, you can't see me? Okay. I can hear uh, you. Okay. Uh, one is just business arising from the minutes. Yeah, that's uh, what that means. That'll be East Exshaw groundwater flooding. And the other one uh, under new business will be the regional airshed zone purple air project. Okay, so gotcha. Uh, any others? Uh, Dean. Um, yes, Cliff. Oh, I can't hear you, Cliff. No, can I can't. Now? Yeah. Okay, under information, just add, uh, I just want to remind everybody that there's an eagle count and uh, you can come and see me out there. I'll give you some more information later. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think Pierre is just coming on board. All right, uh, is there anything else to add to the agenda? Then I want to introduce uh, three new members to our midst. My apologies, Steve, uh, for not introducing you in the previous meeting. It's hard to sometimes get everything together when we're on teams. And uh, Steve is uh, attending a second meeting. He's part of the community contingent. Steve lives in Exshaw and runs the, uh, he and his wife own and run the uh, Exshaw store. They have two little guys, all boy boys, that come over and help me in my yard duties from time to time. But uh, Steve, welcome to the mix and looking forward to many years of service for you here. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. And uh, the next one is uh, uh, Bay Mag. Uh, do I have Renee here? You do? Yeah. Nice to meet you, Dean. Okay. Can't see you. Oh, I uh, can't see you, Renee, but uh, perhaps you'll come up on the screen. Uh, at any rate, uh, Renee, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So I started with Bay Meg on Monday. <laughs> I'll be uh, leading health safety environment. Um, background is I started off as an engineering technologist um, over 20 years ago now. <laughs> um, worked in the field, transitioned to health and safety, helped to lead um, organizational health and safety for over 15 years. Um, Got my pres professional designation and most recently got a master's in leadership. So I also help with organizational change and management of change, things like that. So I'm quite excited to work with AMAG and the wonderful team they have and also with groups like yourselves. Well, welcome on board and we look forward to many years uh, uh, working on important things together. Thanks Thank you. very much. 
And the last of all is uh, 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 Nick, and I'm going to say Ver Verotis. Are you there, there Nick? Is. Yes. Yeah. Hi, Nick. Welcome it's, to uh, the crew. Can you introduce yourself, please? Thank you. Sure. Uh, my name is Nick uh, Variotis, and uh, I started with Lafarge about a month ago. I, I was with Lafarge uh, before, uh, many years ago, back in Bath, Ontario, at the cement plant there, and now I've come to the extra plant to work here. Man, it's a great place to work. Good. I don't know my background, or... Well, welcome and on board. We meet... Uh... Uh, every third month, the next meeting will be in May, the first Wednesday in May. Uh, oh, yes? Hello? Have I missed anybody? No. Okay. So, uh, approval of the minutes. You've looked at the minutes. Are there any errors, omissions, deletions? Paul Ryan, did you put your hand up? No? No. But okay. I'll move the minutes, Mr. Chair. Okay, that would be good. So the minutes are before you and we will receive them by consensus. So if are there any objections? If I don't hear any, they are approved. Hearing none, they are approved. Moving to delegations, we don't have any. Business arising, I have two elements uh, added to the agenda. And that would be East Exshaw. Paul Ryan. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So everybody read the minutes and saw that there was a quite a bit of discussion about uh, Exshaw groundwater flooding. Uh, and uh, since that meeting, MD Council, uh, with the administration's help, has allowed for community members to ask questions of the um, consultant that produced the third party review. Uh, and I would just like administration to update our members on where that is in process. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Right now, uh, McElhaney uh, is Roger Towsley is working on responses to the questions that were submitted by the community members, and he has a deadline to get it to administration by April the 12th. Sorry, by March the 12th. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, the next item, of, are there any other questions? Hearing none, moving on to Kras. Actually, that was going to be new business, Mr. Chair, but I can do it from here. Okay. So uh, some of you know, uh, I am a uh, public member of the Calgary Regional Airshed Zone. So they manage all of the uh, air quality monitors in the Calgary region for Alberta environment. Um, and so um, we've, uh, and I'm, I'm the treasurer for that group. Uh, and so what we came up with uh, is a purple air project. And if I can just... Uh, share my screen here. I'm just going to show you a map. So what the Purple Air Project is, is a, uh, they are small particulate monitors that measure PM 2.5 and PM 10. And uh, they require uh, a Wi-Fi connection and then they go live. So this is actually a map and you can see by Canmore there the numbers two and nine. You see the number four there. And so with this little graph right here, what I'm looking at right now is re real time uh, data for measuring PM 2.5 and PM 10 at Loch des Erks. And there are two monitors in Loch des Erks. Uh, so uh, this is a network that we are establishing. Uh, and the intention is for us to be able to see when we have wildfires and wildfire smoke, uh, the air quality in the plume as it moves from the area into residential areas. So we put one up in Benchlands, uh, which is on Highway 40 by Wipers. Uh, because of all of the smoke that we had from last year's wildfires. So we're putting together this network and anybody can go on there. You just go to uh, the CRAS website. So just craz.ca uh, and then just follow the Purple Air project, and then you can click on the map and you can look at it uh, anywhere. So Kras is doing this, but if individuals want them, uh, you can purchase them from the Purple Air people uh, for around 300 bucks US, I believe. Uh, and all you do is find a place by your house to put it, 
or business to put it, uh, and it hooks up to your Wi-Fi connection and then it sends real-time data uh, onto the network. So it's an interesting project. Uh, I expect to see more of these as people learn about the project and certainly I wanted to make uh, our environment committee aware of it and our members now will know where to go and look for real-time data. That's all I got. I'll take any questions, Mr. Chair. Yeah, um, sorry, um, it's Nick here. I, um, I just want to add that uh, these things are great. Um, I've actually used them uh, at my last uh, co company to uh, check on the uh, particulate matter from the plant. Um, we didn't have Wi-Fi in the area. So one thing I did, um, if you go to uh, uh, MicroHard, they have a small GSM uh, modem that you can use to connect your purple air to the um, uh, sorry, to the uh, internet, and then uh, you don't have to be um, just uh, limited to where your home uh, internet has um, range, but you can actually put it someplace farther away, outdoors, and still be connected to it. Mr. Okay. Chair, it's uh, Darcy Coombs here. If I yeah. can add a little bit here, that little dot in Lactozarx is me. Um, as part of the Bow Valley Clean Air Society, we've actually purchased three of these devices. Uh, one is in Lactis Arcs. One will be uh, with Cliff in Exshaw here fairly quickly. And then we'll have another one uh, in Canmore. And uh, I believe uh, we knew Kraz was also uh, doing this also. Uh, our goal was basically to see if we could have sensors up and down the valley so we could monitor what's coming down the line. And uh, it's quite interesting in terms of how well these sensors uh, correlate in terms of the data that the two existing uh, ones we had in Canmore to the one in Lactis Arcs. You could actually see the plumes coming down. And I'm looking forward to seeing uh, more sensors in the valley. I'd like to see, I think, Kras, uh, Paul, maybe you could speak to this, uh, to talking about putting one in Lake Louise and one in Bath, so we can see, kind of get an idea there. Yes, we are. We're, um, uh, Banff National Park is proving to be a bit of a challenge, uh, but we are certainly spreading the network out and our tech committee uh, is actually looking at where they think it should go uh, to get the best data. Uh, and another thing uh, that is happening, and I forgot to tell you, is that CRAS has a portable air monitoring lab which measures full spectrum of air quality, SOX and NOx, 2.5s and 10s, uh, and we are bringing that into Canmore uh, in April, and it will be there for six months. So it'll be really interesting to see how the purple air monitors measure up against the really expensive monitors. So, but we're doing lots of good work despite uh, government funding cutbacks and things, but. Paul, well, I have a question. It's Amanda, if you have a moment. Mm -hmm. um, is the historical data going to be available for viewing on the, uh, for the various monitors? Will you be able to click on, say, the Lac Arc one at Darcy's house and look at the historical data uh, on a daily basis? I believe so. I'm not 100% on that, Amanda, because okay. uh, this goes into a very large network. Yes. Uh, but that's a good question. I'll find out. That'd be great. Thanks. Yeah, great project. Sorry, I'm just fighting to unmute myself here. Uh, yes, the historic data is available. As a matter of fact, uh, if you look at the uh, sensors in Canmore, you can go back a couple of years. And it's uh, it's interesting because it's not just the uh, uh, U.S. air quality uh, indicator, but it's the Canadian one, the actual raw PM 2.5, humidity and temperature. And oh, uh, all of that data is available. So uh, that's one thing we'll be able to have is kind of a, publicly available source of air quality in the valley. That's great. Thanks, Darcy. I'll go and check. Is it on the website? It is. If you just go yeah. to uh, purpleair.com and yep. click on show me the map, you'll be able to see it all. Perfect. Thanks. And, great idea. And, and there should be one up on Mount Kid Crescent in the very near future. In Exo. This is Cliff <coughs> talking. I'll have mine running uh, by the weekend. Very good. All right, moving on. Thank you. Uh, we're now in unfinished business. We have none and we're going to industrial updates. Andrew, I saw you. Can you bring in information from Francis Cook Landfill, please? 
Certainly can. Thanks, Dean. Um, I don't have a whole lot to update. The site in the last quarter has been relatively quiet. Uh, typically, this is our quiet period of the year anyway, so it's been a little slower than normal. Perhaps COVID kicking in, as everybody's experiencing. Um, but we have been keeping going with getting our house in order, I suppose. While the, the weather's cold, we've been um not doing much litter picking we're gearing up towards that in the spring looking forward to the snow melt and back and getting out there to look after that we're assuming that the volunteer litter picker that normally happens in the springtime may not go ahead with the uh, covid restrictions still in place so bow valley waste will take that on board again this year and we'll assume that role and do a big clean up in the springtime. So kind of April time, May time, we usually get out there and do a, a thorough um, clean up of the parkland, which obviously is impacted by litter issues from the site. So we'll get out there well soon, hopefully. Um, composting, we've been, we, we still have the composting operation ongoing over the the winter time it slows down obviously but we are going to be looking towards screening and blending some of that material once it's matured over the winter and uh, come springtime then we'll, we'll get into the next phase of that um we're crushing some concrete and asphalt on site so that we're ready for spring projects and really that is what we've been keeping busy with so apart from that unless anybody has any questions that's my brief uh, just for our new members, uh, Andrew, can you tell them about the landfill, a little bit the size of staff, uh, maybe years of operation that you've had and will have? Certainly, yeah. Um, so the site is the Francis Cook Regional Class 3 landfill, called Class 3 because we are to accept only inert wastes. So we don't deal with any of the bare bin wastes from the, the valley. We handle mostly construction and demolition wastes. So aggregates, concretes, asphalts. Um, we do compost yard and garden waste that is brought to us by mostly municipalities, but uh, we, we deal mostly with commercial um, traffic. We do also accept residential waste, but the majority of what we deal with is um, commercial in nature. And yeah, we, we deal with mostly wood aggregate materials um the yard and garden stuff scrum brush materials drywall we also handle um industrial waste largely from graymont lime waste as part of the the operation we have a, a separate cell that we handle waste from the um lime industry and um, we have been in operation as a commission for about 20 years around 2000 is when the, the bow valley waste management commission which operates the francis cook landfill came into um, came into practice and i have been cao since 2015 i've been involved with the organization prior to that i worked um, administrative role and uh, have been out there for well, 11 years now. This would be my 11th year out there. So, um, yeah, does that cover off what you were looking for? Yeah, Dean? yeah. Anybody got a any? little idea of who you are and where you are and where the organization's at. The uh, uh, area that you serve as a, a collecting area would be described as? Well, our founding members are the municipalities of Banff, Canmore and the MD of Bighorn. We do accept waste from all of those municipalities and the town sites themselves, not just the, the municipal operations. But um, we also accept waste from further beyond that um, that area from, from as far afield as, as field, BC, and uh, sometimes, well, often Kananaskis. We're really the the um, the closest landfill to the Bow Valley for most most people um, until you hit Calgary. So we deal from anyone that has waste that they generate, which is closest to us, that is inert waste class three that we can accept. This, this How many staff are you, Andrew? Uh, we have about ten full time staff, all in all. 
couple of scale attendants that look after the uh, the ins and outs. Uh, they be the friendly faces that you see at the scale house when you arrive on site. Um, we have a maintenance supervisor, an operations supervisor, four or five operator equipment operators on site, and uh, a couple of uh, office staff. That's that's about it. Can I add something, Dean? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So. Uh, I'm the, for those of you who don't know, I'm the chair of the Waste Commission. I have been for a number of years. Uh, and one of the things that we're very, very proud of is the fact that unlike most landfills, municipally owned landfills in the province, we do not require taxpayer subsidies from the member municipalities. We actually make money. Uh, other municipalities actually have to go and requisition uh, their operating shortfall from the member municipalities, and it's quite high. Uh, so we do very, very well. So taxpayers' dollars do not uh, go to pay for the operation of the landfill. Okay. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Not hearing any. Moving on then. Uh, I've got Bay Mag next. Jim, have you, are you presenting? Yeah. Yeah, let me uh, share my screen here, Dean, huh? Okay. Unless Leslie, you, unless Leslie, unless you want to share it, I have it up and ready to go. So I'm happy to do that for you if you'd like. Wonderful. That's hey. a better solution. <laughs> One second. <laughs> so yeah, Harry, uh, we still got hit Harry on the hook till uh, June thirtieth. Oh. Wednesday, June thirtieth, till about four p.m. to be precise. Yeah. <laughs> He's, uh, he's doing some uh, commissioning uh, integration work for us on our new plant. So still a valued part of the team and uh, trying to capture his 33 years of knowledge uh, in this period of time is our one of our highest priorities. So, so yeah, here's Bay Mag um, and um, lots of things happening. Um, we're right in the middle of a construction project, which you'll see about. But before we get in there, uh, Cam... Uh, next slide. There you go. Um, Cam, who's also been a long-term member uh, of the Bay Mag team, uh, been been with us since 1990. Um, past 14 years or so, he's been our health, safety, and environmental coordinator and uh, active on this committee uh, the whole time. So very happy that uh, uh, Cam is uh, going into retirement with a long, healthy, uh, successful fishing uh, trip ahead of him and uh but gonna be missed certainly he's does so much in the plant uh, uh always has and uh uh really appreciate all he's done and then you met renee earlier she introduced herself and so there's a picture of renee uh just started on monday and uh really excited to have her part of the team we uh looked long and hard and uh renee was uh, the clear uh clear choice for us uh to join baymag so really happy to have her experience and uh, and uh, see where she takes us. So welcome Renee and and uh, take good care Cam. This will be Cam's last meet. Well, he might still be around. No, this will be Cam's last meeting. So um, here you go. Any last shots at Cam, you better take them now. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, quick uh, update on safety. Uh, really proud of our results. We're going on our second consecutive year with no lost time accident. Um, and the uh, medical incidents we had last year that are shown there are, were all very, very um, low severity um, uh, in most cases. So happy about that. Also, our COVID uh, precautions uh, have worked. Um, we've had no employee-to-employee -employee transmissions in the plant uh, since the beginning. Uh, we, have, we have had three COVID positive cases, though, that are, were the result of a direct contact either through a child or a friend or a family member outside of the work. And uh, so very happy that our precaution, precautionary methods have worked, uh, as I'm sure the rest of the industrial partners have, have been uh, leveraging the same actions. Uh, in addition to that, you can see there's a strong connection of our of our good safety results uh, with our proactive actions that you see there on the right graph. And um, we continue to have multiple meetings and a great safety committee uh, that comes out of it and inspections and audits and just a myriad of activities, uh, both leading and lagging indicators are, are very positive for us at the plant. 
Next slide. We do have some concerns just to raise. I'm sure uh, this is nothing new. Uh, this is just an example. It happens to be on New Year's Day, but uh, it really doesn't matter whether it's a holiday or a, a weekend. Uh, it's really been tough uh, being so close to the Grotto Canyon parking lot. Uh, that whole section of road has really just become uh, a bit of a disaster here recently. This This picture in particular uh, actually, it's from a video. Uh, we have a video in this corner all the time. And uh, you can see that truck pulling off, uh, one of our delivery trucks pulling off the off the highway there. And the car is right behind him uh, that basically hit the brakes uh, and swerved into the other lane uh, to get around the truck. Uh, because, quite frankly, our turning lane uh, that's where all those other cars are parked uh, coming from the eastbound side uh you know was basically blocked so just as you know creates such a such a congestion such a hazard and it's it's an uh, it's amazing we haven't had a fatality there um uh at this point it's really been a problem um and then you see a myriad of pedestrians there on the arrow on the left they walk right up and down that area like they own it and uh not realizing that there's trucks coming both from the east but Primarily from the west are ore trucks that come uh, from BC, uh, enter in from the west side there. And um, yeah, just we've had quite a few close calls. So I guess our only ask is just to continue to uh, request enforcement along there. Uh, I know there's lots of no parking signs along that area. We've added a few ourselves, to be honest, and uh, um, just continue to ask for um continued dil diligence and some enforcement along that area to send a send a strong message to our friends from elsewhere. Next slide. Uh, this is the same slide we showed back in, uh, I guess it was December meeting. Uh, we, we do our stack tests annually um, and we did them last year in June. Uh, once again, very, very good results last year. This year we'll be doing uh, two, two rounds of stack tests, one in one in May um, on both the furnaces, and then we'll do another one, we're thinking in October on the new process, the, the gas suspension calciner that's starting up in uh, uh, June, July this year. So we'll have a couple rounds of tests we're doing uh, this year, and we'll certainly share those results uh, um, when they're available. But strong history, uh, you can see over time how the limit has changed from uh 2017 down into the the current uh, limit uh, for the furnaces as well as the much lower limit for the new process line which which makes sense it's a much more efficient and state-of-the-art technology so the limit should be lower next slide uh so here is the the new uh project uh similar similar as last last time but uh, certainly lots of activity uh going on uh, the photo on the left is the uh, ultimate, uh, what it's going to look like. We've added the feed silo on the left side, the gas suspension calciner that you see the, the tower there. Nothing like the Lafarge Tower down the street, but uh, big by our own rights. Um, uh, what's not shown there is we have a new, new bag house, uh, new heat exchanger, and uh, off to the right there you see some four new storage silos that we... Uh, we put in to support the additional capacity. And then on the right is a uh, is a picture of the status as of the end of um, January. And uh, in true form, the uh, extra wind does not disappoint. It's uh, it slowed things down just a little bit. We're maybe uh, three or four days behind schedule. So the guys uh, have done a good job being uh, adaptable to the uh, wind variations that we see in the valley. And when the wind is blowing up, too 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 much up top. They uh, they focus on the work zones that are down closer to the ground, as you see there on the right. So, next slide. Um, and then just quick summary. Uh, you can see our uh, approval was uh, just about a year ago. Uh, well, a little over a year ago. Um, and uh, lots happened since then. You know, we we broke ground uh, just a few weeks after COVID. So I can tell you that was a uh, a few sleepless nights. The CEO and I had many discussions around 
is this the right thing to do? We got the money approved, but amidst COVID and all the volumes uh, shrinking the way they did last year, it was a it was a pretty tough check to write that first one in March last year. Uh, but we're very happy we did so. Um, the the volumes are uh, are there and uh, customers are waiting, and we're excited to get this off the ground. But there's just some some uh, you can read this offline. But there's just some of the additions to the local economy that we're providing with this new operation, both on the construction side and and permanent new hires uh, here at Baymac. Okay. Next slide. Uh, current status, you can see we've pretty much built the superstructure up to the highest level, level seven. Uh, cladding, you can see, is up to about level five. Um, and then, uh, as you can imagine, there's a, you know, 30 plus uh, mechanical guys inside and the electricians are mobilized now. So it is uh, literally people uh, stepping on each other's toes there inside the building as they get the equipment installed. And uh, the products the silos are in place now. We did those back in November. You, I think you probably saw the uh, the uh, circus of uh, trucks coming from uh, Innisfail with those silos back in late November last year. And then in the front there, you can see the new feed silo, the new bag house, and the new heat exchanger, like I said before. And then time, next slide. Uh, uh, timing wise, uh, we're still looking at being done mechanical completion here in, in April. And uh, commissioning, which is really Harry's focus, uh, and the rest of the team is learning as we go, uh, is going to be May through June. And we're looking at a late June, early July startup. And uh, as you can imagine, lots of training going on. We just did a bunch of training uh, this morning, matter of fact. And so the team is really uh, excited about uh, where we're headed with this project. Uh, next slide. And that's it. Any questions for for Baymag or uh, parting shots for Cam? I welcome welcome both. <laughs> Jim, I'll ask a question. Yeah. Do you, okay. do you, do you, once all the construction traffic dies down, the with the extension with the new calcifier, then do you expect much more volume to be coming in and out of the plant, or roughly the same? Yeah, we're looking at a 25% production increase that comes with yep. the new process line. Yeah. Okay. So that's, for Baymag, that's about uh, 30,000 tons annually. And there'll be a ramp up curve. Uh, that won't all come in year one, but it'll come over a series of, of years for sure. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Jim, did you get uh, uh, an email from Ryan Singleton? The yes, RC I'll reach out to Ryan for sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Good. I'll reach out to him separately and uh, and uh, get him out for a tour whenever it makes sense. Yeah, I'll be saying a little more about that in the uh, municipal update, but I wanted to be sure you got that email. No, I appreciate you you guys uh, you know leaning in and and getting more uh, enforcement out there for us. It's going to make a difference uh, eventually for sure. So, okay, okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Jim. And then going to uh, Lafarge. Janet, are you there? Hello. Oh, there she is. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, Leslie, would you mind controlling our slides for us once again, please? There we go. Excellent. Um, so as uh, Dean uh, mentioned, there's uh, been some personnel changes uh, on site and, and with Lafarge, you can um, go to the next slide, Leslie. Uh, I'll be retiring uh, in a few weeks. Um, and Nick, Nick Variotis, there he is with his uh, very large pooch, lap dog. Uh, he'll be taking over uh, all of the environmental and public affairs uh, duties. He brings a wealth of experience to uh, to the plant. I think we're really fortunate to uh, to have him with us, um, having worked at the bath plant um, 
you know, he, he went through his engineering education in Guelph and uh, his graduate work in atmospheric chemistry, which I'm sure could be very handy here, uh, and lots of experience um, in Alberta and Saskatchewan, Ontario, oil and gas and mining. So I, I think we're in a really good place to have uh, uh, Nick uh, take over this role. Um, so Nick is going to... Uh, carry on with the presentation, nothing like jumping right into it. Um, and uh, you can go to the next slide, please, Leslie. And Nick will take over. <clears throat> okay, um, just a bit of our community outreach. Uh, we're gonna be partnering with the uh, um, Alberta Environment Parks to uh, collar the big, bighorn sheep uh, to monitor their uh, movements in the area, exposure to uh, diseases from uh, um, uh, domesticated sheep um, and it's going to have a, a pretty large uh, uh, scope of area that we're going to be looking at from the Bow Valley to the uh, Kananaskis. Also uh, Lafarge is looking to improve their, their sheep habitat on site. Um, this was the first site that I came to that I, have, I saw signs where it said uh, uh, sheep crossing and I mean I've been to other plants in the states that said you know don't bring your guns to work but Sheep is a different one. <laughs> so I like this a lot better than the guns. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is just showing our uh, pretty much from January, uh, from November to January, our um, uh, nitrogen oxide emissions and our sulfur dioxide emissions uh, compared to the uh, uh, ambient uh, limits. Um, and we're way uh, below those uh, limits. Uh, um, next slide, please. Um, this is more of the uh, trends as how we've been improving or not improving on some things from back from 2014 to uh, the end of 2019. Um, we're in a very windy corridor, but that's no excuse. Like we're still trying to improve our uh, management of our uh, dust on the site. Uh, my, my expertise is in uh, turbulence and uh, wind flow and things like that because I was doing my PhD in that. Um, so this brings a, a great challenge and I'm looking forward to kind of taking that head on and with uh, your help too, I'm hoping that I get some uh, input uh, from some people to, to help with this. But um, it, there's a, a marginal increase from, from the uh, the entrance uh, dust uh, from the uh, industrial berm dust. It's not really much of a, a, a change. Um, the lagoon's about the same and the background is about the same. Uh, next, next slide, please. Um, so this one shows a bit of a pattern, and what the pattern is, is uh, roughly in about 2016, you know, we had the construction of the K6 kiln, um, and there's a big lull in the dust, and then um, there's a pickup of dust towards the end. But towards the end of uh, 2019, uh, we've kind of come back to pretty close, if not a bit, just a touch lower than our uh, uh, 2014 emissions, but I think we can improve uh, um, our uh, dust emissions from, from site. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I want to uh, put things in perspective. So this is our uh, Windridge TSP and uh, PM 2.5 uh, monitor. The blue, the blue line uh, corresponds to the uh, left axis or the blue axis and the green is a 2.5 that corresponds to the right, right axis. And um, while we were <clears throat> under uh, the um, ambient uh, or objective for PM 2.5, uh, we were over by on, a, on the PSP on a few occasions due to the high winds and the construction area. Um, I'm gonna be talk talking about the replanting of the trees in that area there to um, help with a, uh, a green belt for the uh, residents and also act like as a windbreak there. Uh, slide, please. Uh, this one is as close as you can get to the plant. Well, I'm, I mean, the entrance is closer, but um, this is pretty much in our operations and you can see the strong winds. Uh, we've had a fairly high um, amount of dust in some periods and 
so our, our challenge is what can we do when the wind is really strong? And what I'm looking at is putting some kind of physical barriers to either um, slow down or deflect the wind so that, that they're not coming across our whole, whole site as long. But there's, there's going to be some work on that because that doesn't happen uh, uh, overnight. Next slide, please. Okay, this one's at the uh, lagoon just a bit uh, east of our front gate, south of uh, highway, I believe it's 1X, or is it 1A? Don't shoot me. 1A. 1A. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and as you can see, our PM 2.5 has been good there. Um, there's been a, just a couple incidents where our total particulate matter has been uh, over the limit. And uh, so that's, you know, so as you get a bit farther, things drop down fairly quickly. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is right at our entrance. Um, and, you know, we've had a, our ups and downs with the dust, as you can see here. Um, most of these correlate to really high uh, uh, wind periods in, in the area. Um, and the PM10, uh, or sorry, the PM2.5, these particles, 2.5 microns and smaller, um, are are just underneath the um, a limit or, or, or very close to, but that's in very close proximity to the plant. Um, next slide, please. Um, there we go. Um, so what this is, is the monthly wind rows of the wind. So um, that's it. If we, if we look at January, um, the, uh, the magnitude of the line or, or the triangle uh, tells you the, where the wind's coming from. So in this case, it's the west and the speed, which is uh, 25 to 100 kilometers per hour. Uh, and you can see by looking at the months, uh, predominantly the wind is from the west. There's a, a bit of wind from the east on certain months, months but about 90% of the wind in the area comes uh, uh, over the mountains and comes down as a valley effect. So if you think of us as in a big bowl um, and the mountains kind of funnel the air through. And if I can, if you can just point to um, October and there's a little triangle kind of at the, no, up, up, uh, yeah, up, up further, up, up, up. Okay, anyway, um, yeah. In the month of October, there's that triangle kind of in from the uh, uh, south, uh, you know, uh, southwest, and that's that's probably the uh, uh, one of where, where the wind where the wind comes and that hits our plant uh, right on. So those those are uh, more of a problem problem uh, directional wind. But again, um, I'll, I'll be looking at what we can do to. Um, reduce the impacts on site, uh, but I'm not promised any uh, miracles, but I, we will definitely be working at this to uh, have a definite increase in the uh, dust emissions. Can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, um, you know, this means some talk about uh, the silt beds at Lock and Lac Zarks. Um, and this is a picture from that. Uh, um, and why this is important is because uh, there could be some contribution from this, this area when the lake's low and the silt beds are exposed. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, so right now, the west monitor that's supposed to be our background uh, monitor is fairly high. It's on Highway 1A and it's way up the curb on top. It, it's not really picking much up there. Um, it's kind of in a secluded spot. So we have approval to move that west monitor down uh, to the west side of the plant, uh, uh, right, kind of near the bend of, of the road. And uh, what this is going to do is it'll give us a better in indication of the background of dust coming onto the plant. Um, and also we'll, we, we can see how that contributes to um, the total dust from the area. So um, there's a bit of background in there and we're just trying to uh, define where that is. Um, can you go to the next slide? I can't remember what this one is. 
Does everyone see a white screen? Yep. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. give me one second. <laughs> okay, I thought it was just me. Probably our dial up uh, connection is slow here at the plant. So. <laughs> Could be a picture of a ground blizzard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was just a few weeks ago. I, I remember driving home and that. I couldn't see anything in front of me. So while we're waiting for that. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, can you go back to the last slide before we jump into noise? Um, so the idea of having the purple air things are really great um, because they give you what's happening either outdoors or indoors. Um, I've, 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 had, I've used them at minus 45. They work like a charm. Um, but you do have to have the uh, power adapter in a closed uh, uh, environmental proof little box. So what I had was I was installing a number of them at uh, the steel plant that I was working for before. And because we were out in the boonies and we, we wanted it off at the uh, company network for uh, security reasons, uh, I, I installed a uh, little GSM uh, modems. And if you look at the website, micro hard, yeah, these modems are about the size of this thing. It's really, really small. And uh, if you compare that to the size of the phone, I mean, that's how small they are. You, you, you put a GSM card in there and uh, you plug the adapter in again. So they both need 120 uh, volts to operate. But I, I was talking to the uh, per, uh, person at the Purple Air and you can modify them to run on battery power. Uh, but for their general purpose of selling them, they come with an adapter. Um, and what they are basically is a uh, pretty smart. Uh, the guy who invented this, and that's probably in vacation someplace permanently, but it's a fence post top. It, it's really high tech. And they put a screw in it, so they have a little, little uh, arm that kind of, you know, you can screw it onto a wall or something. Inside are two little um, uh, blue boxes that are uh, small lasers that count particles. There's a small flow in there and a very small circuit board. Uh, if you were to take them apart, that's what you see in there, and it's kind of neat. Um, and yes, you can get the ones that have an SD card in them. Um, also, if they're public, you can go to uh, just put your mouse over top of the uh, purple air, and this little uh, dialog box will pop up. And then there's a little, um, in that widget, it'll, it'll say download. If you click that, it'll take you to another web page where you can download all the data from that. Um, uh, purple air monitor and you could go back as, as far as you want the only catch is it doesn't come in one file it comes in multiple files so i think it's one file per two days so if you ask for a month you might get 30 files anyway so i just wanted to say that uh, i'm looking at putting some of those around the plant uh because the reason why i like them is they first of all they're on the purple air website so anyone can see them it gives us a, a quick response to how we're doing at the plant to manage our dust. It also tells us what the background is like, um, because there are some days when uh, you know there's a forest fire and some monitors pick up something, some don't, and this will be able to give you uh, in the micro scale what's happening, but also when you zoom out, you can see on the meso scale and the macro scale how the air is in 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 the area of the Bull Valley. So that's why I like them. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we had our uh, we had an acoustical assessment um, last year, and so the uh, gray line is 2019, and the nice green line is uh, 2020. Uh, we've improved in some areas, in some locations. 
um, and some of the cases were about the same. Um, I'm sure you're more uh, more familiar than I am where these locations are, but just have them up there for, for a comparison. And the red line is a daytime limit. Uh, next uh, next uh, slide, please. Um, hmm, I was updating these slides and I forget what the blue thing is, but it doesn't matter. Again, this is a comparison of 2019 and 2020 at uh, Mount Ellen Drive. Uh, we have some work to do there for the nighttime, uh, but we have improved in some areas and some areas have gotten worse. So we'll have to look into those. Uh, uh, the problem is with uh, an acoustic assessment, you also have to take into consideration the uh, meteorological conditions that are happening. Uh, because if you have an inversion that could actually keep the sound low and it'll just kind of propagate um, farther, while if there's no inversion, the same situation, but there's no impact on the uh, on receptor. Uh, next slide, please. Low carbon fuels. Uh, uh, so we're uh, designed to handle fuels that derive from uh, construction dem uh, demolition materials, woods, plastic, asphalt singers, tire fluff, rubber carpets, textiles, small green men, and uh, other widgets. Now, uh, <laughs> so we're, uh, we're, we want to go to a net zero economy. What that is, is looking at uh, for example, tires, there's a lot of, the rubber comes to the trees, is the, uh, the rubber tree. So it's a renewable source. It's not like a fossil fuel. So we're trying to get away from that. Um, and, it's, and it's a challenge, but, you know, we're, we're bringing on that challenge. And this is one reason I love cement is because we walk the walk. Uh, I worked in oil and gas and I will never go back there again. Uh, and there's reasons for that. But so I, I'm open to this challenge. I welcome it, and I'm hoping that we can work on this challenge, everyone's input, to uh, reduce our CO2 emissions from the, the plant. Anyway, getting back to this, so uh, the, the fuels are going to be uh, processed off-site by uh, eco-recycling. They're going to be delivered to the plant in closed trailers. Uh, the closed trailers are going to go into a building. Uh, where there's a storage crane and it'll be unloaded, and it'll be closed up and they'll be driving off. So there won't be trucks with tires and fluff and stuff on top, you know, because some people envision the truck going down the road and the stuff flying out the back. That's not happening. It's, it's only a sealed truck. Um, and that's going to be sometime in the future. We're still working on the plans to develop the area. Next slide, please. Okay, this little picture here, um, the orange uh, rectangle with the X on it is the approximate area of the, um, the LCF uh, handling area where the trucks are gonna go in and come out. Uh, the, the green line that goes from there to Kiln 6 Tower, it, it'll be a closed conveyor. So there's a, a, a conveyor that goes up and as it goes up, it's going to close into a, almost like a pipe. And that's going to go up to the top where it opens up and it'll, it'll drop the uh, material in there to be uh, processed in the kiln. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a better picture than I could draw um, of a conceptual layout. Um, as you see, there's the uh, two uh, truck bays in there. So trucks will be back in there. Um, and they'll be offloaded and then It'll be, uh, as you can see, uh, conveyed at the back, right up to the top of K6. Go to the next slide, please. And it's just another uh, a view of that, of the uh, calcine uh, injection from the top of the K6 tower, looking down at the LCF uh, area. Next slide, please. And that's it. Does anyone have any questions? Questions of Nick? I do. Uh, sure. Okay. I think that's you, Paul, is it? Okay, sure. Uh, thank you for that, Nico, and welcome. Um, just a couple of things. I saw that the drawing you have there of the offloading facility for your low carbon fuels. Uh, are we going to make sure that the doors are closed when they're unloading? Yes. 
we're um, uh, we're uh, going to have uh, procedures in there. So when the trucks are in there, the doors are going to be closing. They're not going to be left open uh, for obvious reasons. Because um, we we want it as as a whole sealed system. So the trucks go in, doors close, the back opens up, and they take stuff out of there. Okay, thank you. Um, one other question for you. I live up on Mount Kid Crescent, and you probably don't know where that is. Um, but I am uh, on a cul-de-sac that's uh, pretty much directly across from the north end of your storage hall. Uh, and so the snow up here is turning black. <laughs> and uh, this has happened in the past. Janet Brigger might, I think, might remember this. Um, and it was determined by your folks that the source of that uh, and also the TSPs that are collecting on vehicles was coming from your storage hall because the doors were left open on the storage hall. And uh, I know that that's a training thing. Uh, however, uh, I've noticed recently large, very large plumes of dust coming out of the area where your doors for your storage hall actually are. So um, that's probably why I'm getting a purple air monitor. Uh, but I think uh, operationally uh, it was cured the last time. Uh, mm -hmm. by putting in some sort of um, something that notifies ops when the doors are left open uh, for too long. So just wanted to bring that to your attention. Oh, thanks. Thank you uh, for doing that. And if you ever see it happening, please uh, call me right away or, you know, call the line. Um, I'm also looking at uh, some things that we can put at the doors to keep the air inside from, uh, like, Preventing it from going out when the doors are open. Okay, thank you for that. Okay. Other questions for Nico? I have a question for the people. Uh, those that are on uh, the PISAs, do you know what David Spink is? Is he still on that committee in uh, Calgary for uh, PISAs? I think you're talking about PAMS. Um, yeah, uh, the one that's based out of... Uh, that's a little north of Calgary. Okay. Uh, Paul's talking about CRAS, that's Calgary Metropolitan. Right. Uh, PAMS would be up uh, in the north of Airdrie. So I, I'd be referring to uh, CRAS. Is, okay. is, uh, is there a David Spink that attends that uh, sometimes? Uh, not that I see. Uh, okay. But he could very well be there because a lot of the industry uh, people, they have uh, their reps sit on individual committees like technical committees and communications and governance committees, policy committees, uh, but they don't go to board meetings. And I, so I don't recall him ever being at a board meeting. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, not hearing any uh, uh, questions. I'm going to move on then. Thank you, Nico. Uh, you. You're welcome. Uh, I saw Mike Lavecchio uh, come on screen. Mike, are you there? Hi, Dean. Good. Did you Good want to bring any sorry. Uh, address from yeah. CP? Uh, oh, no, no particular update from CP other than I'll just note where um, we are gearing now for construction season, maintenance. Saying that uh, all of you in the Bighorn Corridor can expect to see in coming months. Okay, you're breaking up quite badly, Mike. But we did get the idea that uh, construction season was coming, and some of it would be in the valley. Anything Mike. to ask? Sorry, I, I, my internet connection is just disastrous this afternoon. Okay. Um, if uh, I, I I switched off the camera to try and balance it a little, but uh, I missed I missed I missed the the entire question. Okay, the uh, question was: Did you have anything to bring forward as a report from CP? Thank you. Um, the uh, just. A note that uh, construction season will be starting soon, and that, that for us is track maintenance. Um, no major projects within 
Bighorn, but uh, you will probably see maintenance forces out there uh, over the course of the next few months doing uh, doing routine track maintenance. Okay. Questions of CP? Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Okay, moving on to uh, last but not least, Greymont. Amanda. <laughs> Thank you, Dean. Um, hi, everybody. Leslie, will you queue up the presentation? And I'm just going to say a few words and uh, uh, welcome our new members. So, Steve, uh, we're, we're both community members, so welcome aboard. It's nice to see your face uh, here at this table and not just... Uh, just at the store. Um, and Renee and uh, Nico, uh, welcome uh, to my colleagues at Bay Meg and Lafarge. I look forward to uh, collaborating uh, as we move forward. Um, and I'll just tell you guys a little bit about who we are. So we're Greymont, and we have been a lime producer in the Bow Valley in our location that we are on right now since about 1886. Um, we were the hosts of the original uh, Rocky Mountain Park Gates that was located on our site. Uh, we currently um, uh, have a quarry. Our gap quarry is seven kilometers west of us towards Canmore. So our, our haul trucks do come through town. Uh, um, there it's a contractor, Jerk Creek, that carries that uh, the rock for us uh, to the site. So directly we employ about 76 uh, direct employees and um, a significant uh, indirect employees in the valley too. So we're really happy to be at the table and and uh, and be working here. We love it. What a beautiful place. Um, at the, also from Greymont, joining me today is uh, Pierre uh, Boucher. He's our superintendent. He's uh, nine years uh, with Greymont. And John Thatcher, our plant manager, who's been with us a year and a half. And I have been privileged enough to be there for the last 10 years um, and eight of that as the HSC specialist. So, so do not hesitate to uh, contact me. I know uh, Renee, Jim has all my contact information and uh, uh, Nico, Janet will be able to provide mine and it will be on this presentation. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, Leslie, next slide, please. Uh, so our air monitoring station um, is located at the uh, western edge of uh, our pond, directly uh, east of us um, as, our, as you enter our village on that end. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Leslie, we can see the layout. So we have set up there a weather station and four monitors. Uh, we have a PM 2.5, a PM 10, and we run two, uh, at this time, two TSP monitors in that area. And uh, as some of you will recall, that was because we were uh, struggling with some illogical data. So we would have data sets where the uh, 2.5 um, was slightly greater than the TSP results or vice versa. So we have been running um, the four monitors uh, to just monitor those illogical results. And you will see we do periodically have them, though though less so. We, do a, we have a very stringent maintenance and servicing program on these monitors. They are heavily exposed. So when there's gusting of 75 kilometers everywhere else in the valley, I can tell you across that pond, it is even more so. Um, it's uh, it's quite an exposed area, so uh, so we do see uh, the weather impacts just as Lafarge does as well. And I'm really excited about the Purple Box uh, program and the moving of uh, of your monitor, uh, Nico, on the west side. Uh, next slide, please, Leslie. So here's our uh, PM 2.5, and uh, um, Steve, uh, you when you get your uh, agenda or the minutes package, have a look at the little bubble. It tells you a little bit about what point, uh, 2.5 means. So these are microns of less than 2.5. Uh, they're respirable health concerns. So of course, we measure those um, and we want to know if our plant is having an impact. And uh, you will see the dark blue line across the uh, the top there at 30. That is the ambient air quality objective by the province. Um, and we did have an exceedance back in uh, September. That was the Devil's Head fire, uh, as Dean mentioned, um, or maybe it was Paul, the wildfires up uh, the Wipers area. Um, and then we did have, since our last meeting um, there in December, I had an incomplete sample period. And you're going to see that on all three of our measurement slides. And that was the power outage on uh, Christmas Eve Eve. Um, the monitors were all set to run. And uh, though the power came on uh, for most of the grid at 8, I think about 8 p.m. that evening, our village has a, is, has, is a branch of that grid. And they did not get power returned to our uh, residents until approximately 2 in the morning. So we did not have 
a full 24 hour sample period. So that sampling period was considered invalid. Uh, next slide, please, Leslie. So this is the PM10, and these are particulates that, or droplets that are about 10 microns or less. They are also, also respiratable health concerns. They typically are uh, dust sources, smoke, agricultural roadways. Um, so you will see that uh, the we are there's no objective for this, so we just measure it. Um, uh, for the information, and I know uh, years ago there was uh, concern about PM10 in the Valley, I remember from the BCEC committee. So we continue to monitor the PM10 in six day cycles on our site. And you can see the incomplete uh, sample period is noted there as well as the, the uh, Devil's Head fire. Um, and we did have, uh, you'll see there's two dots there in the September. We did have an illogical data where the 2.5 uh, exceeded the, uh, was greater, Pardon me, the PM10 was greater than the TSP uh, measurement on that uh, occasion. Um, and we have not ever been able to figure out why that happens. So I've often wondered if it was weather patterns um, and we worked with Alberta Environment on that and we could not uh, answer that question, but we also could not identify a source. So uh, next slide, please, Leslie. Uh, so this is the total suspended particulates. Um, these are zero to 500 uh, microns. They include the 2.5 and the uh, PM10. Uh, they typically are sources that are visible to the naked eye. Uh, they don't tend to stay air suspended in the air very long. Um, so this would be things like ash and spore and pollen. Um, it could be coal dust or, or grit dust sources. So um, you can see we did have an exceedance in uh, uh, January, um, we were unable to trace that uh, that exceedance to anything. Uh, our plant activity was normal. We had no reports on site. Um, I did speak to uh, Banff National Park um, and looked at a few of the burns going around. And there is slash pile burning going on, of course, in January. Um, that is not regulated or documented because permits aren't required. So uh, we were unable to identify a source for that exceedance. Um, and it did show on both our TSP monitors. We had one that exceeded. Uh, we we just were above the line uh, by 0, 01, um, and our other uh, TSP monitor was just under the uh, the objective, the 24-hour quality objective. Next slide, Leslie. So you can see our uh, SO2, which is a passive monthly monitoring, is uh, fairly consistent and very low compared to the uh, ambient air quality objective. Next slide. There is no objective for the NO2. Uh, we do have consistently low uh, under 10 uh, parts per million. So um, that has been consistent over the year. Next slide, please. Uh, so just a, um, to re revisit our stack testing and uh, Steve and Renee and Nico, so you know our requirements. So we stack test our kilns twice a year. Uh, it is scheduled for the year to come in the end of May and again in August. And so we test for total suspended particulates, the SO2 and NO2. Um, and there are some conditions associated with our permit. So uh, we do have to have an 80% production rate and that's based on our average production rates. And then we also have to consider our fuel blend. We are permitted to, um, run on natural gas and uh, use coal in our kilns. Um, I can tell you we rarely we rarely use coal, but we do periodically. Um, and so if we've used coal in the 90 days prior to our stack testing, then we would you, we would test with a blended fuel that reflects our coal usage. Uh, we also have an ore sorter. So um, the X-ray ore sorter, we test once a year um, just for total suspended particulates. So we're really just testing that fugitive dust element and it's a manual stack survey that they conduct. And again, we do that at 80% production rates. And then every five years, so we did this in 2020 and we will do it again in 2025 on kiln one, we do do a heavy metals testing and that is related to the permit um, to, to burn coal. And uh, so I'm gonna share those results with you uh, just next, next slide. Uh, so our regular stack testing, um, 
as you guys may recall, we ended up splitting our ta stack testing. There was some weather weather and wind issues that prevented us from completing our fall one. So we did it in December for kiln two. Um, and you can see our results there. So our uh, total suspended particulate is uh, 0.023. So just about half of what the approval limit is. And we don't have an approval li limit for the SO2 or the NO2. So we, we measure those numbers and we monitor for any um, increases. So what we'd like to see is steady or lower uh, year over year. Next table, please. So this is our metals testing, the five-year results. Um, so it is a collection and I'm, I'm afraid I'm not as well versed in the metals. So they do several classes of metals uh, on a dry testing. And uh, um, I am just learning about this. So if you have questions, shoot me an email um, and I will get all the information and try my best to reiterate you with, with what it all means. And uh, I have actually asked for a... Uh, uh, um, a comparative to the previous uh, metal stack testing so I can learn and I can share that with you guys if you're interested in it. Next slide please Leslie. So the ore sorter um, we have an uh, approval limit of 0 0.05 and we were at 0 0.003 so our uh, ore sorter um, dust collection system is obviously very very effective and it is an electric uh, operation. Next slide. So excluding any um, ambient air related environmental reporting, we did have some environmental reports since we last met in December. So we had uh, a continuous emissions monitoring uptime issue for the month of November. So uh, the objective is 90% uptime. So the continuous emissions monitoring system that we have is an opacity meter um, that is on our uh, kiln two stack where the bag house is. Um, and we measure the opacity and the opacity objective limit is 20% for us. Um, uh, other than a 10 second blip at some point during the last few months, I, we never see that 20%. Um, we have to report it if it exceeds six minutes at 20%. Um, but in November, we did experience uh, an analyzer malfunction and uh, that uh, meant the the unit wasn't quite correctly measuring. And as a result, our uptime was considered to be 87.1%. Uh, we did have our instrument techs uh, service that and optimize the operations. Uh, we also had a air pollution uh, equipment failure uh, in December. So there was a fan associated with a bin vent uh, for our lime kiln dust uh, uh, silo. Um, this fan blows air through the, the bin dust collection system, so to prevent fugitive dust from escaping, blows the air through um, and is released through the bin vent uh, so that it's not releasing when we're loading or inputting product. Um, the, the fan failed. Uh, we, we did review the video to ensure there was no fugitive dust emissions during that time and we did repair that fan. And then unfortunately, the month of December was also a challenge for us with our continuous emissions monitoring, uh, the opacity meter. So um, after significant troubleshooting, we identified uh, an electronic, electronic component of the unit had failed. Um, we had to involve the uh, service technicians who are unfortunately in this state. So it was an interesting combination of phones and internet and video, uh, getting them to assist us in the troubleshooting and that we are, we're pleased to have it repaired. Uh, we did only have an uptime of 65.3% uh, out of our 90. And then we did have a uh, experience of process water leak from our scrubber. So uh, for Steve and Renee and uh, Nico, we have a scrubber uh, system on our kiln one, um, a wet scrubber system that is slated to be replaced when our environmental permit is approved. We will get a proper uh, new bag house, similar to the other one we have. So we had a nozzle failure um, and this resulted in about 3000 liters 3,400 litres of process water was dispersed from the top of our scrubber onto the hot process equipment and the engineered ground below. Uh, we were able to repair the nozzle in, in approximately about an hour and a half, two hours. Um, and we did monitor uh, to ensure that the water did not escape the engineered ground. Our site is designed um, so that all surface water is collected um, in a, a lined pond. And we do do groundwater testing uh, twice a year in seven different groundwater wells to ensure that uh, that nothing escapes our site uh, that could be harmful. Uh, during this time, we did not uh, observe any fugitive dust emissions either. Uh, next slide, please, Leslie. So our operating permit renewal, um, I have no updates. Um, as some of you know, and uh, 
for our new members information, um, our operating permit technically expired in May of 2020. Um, we had submitted our renewal application uh, the year before um, and had been uh, advised that it would be reviewed. Uh, that didn't happen and uh, there, it still hasn't been. We have resubmitted an application. They extended our permit uh, for two uh, in May for a year and uh, we are have not heard officially that they will extend it again, but we anticipate they might. So our uh, second renewal application is awaiting review. Um, that operating permit does contain uh, some great improvements. Uh, we will replace, as I mentioned, the wet scrubber with a bag house system, similar to our kiln two bag house system. Uh, we will also replace an, uh, a process wet scrubber with a bag house and we will install a bag house on a uh, dressing and screening section of our uh, crusher and stone um, stone system uh, and we will remove the uh, intermittent ambient air monitoring system for a 24-hour system uh, that is automated and will be able to be giving us data continuously so we're really looking forward to that can continuous sampling system, especially me, because I go out and change the filters in the wind. <laughs> so I'll really like the continuous one. Uh, so once we've got that permit review done, uh, we will move to a public um, process as required. And uh, and we're really looking forward to beginning that and sharing with the community um, our improvements and getting feedback. Next slide, please. Now it's on you guys. So there's my contact information. So please do not hesitate uh, to reach out to me uh, for anybody that has questions or thoughts, but you can also ask me questions right now. Okay, questions of Amanda, please. I can't see you, so I'll have to hear you. There we go. Some of you have got any questions of Amanda. I'm not hearing any. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Amanda, and all that upgrades on your new application are of interest to the whole community. Yes, and we're eagerly anticipating uh, being able to move forward on them. Yes. Thank you. Good. All right, I'll go to the municipal updates now. Uh, there's a few. First of all, the two piezometers on Jura Creek, or, or Exshaw Creek, on the east bank have been replaced. They have been, uh, they were removed during construction and they're in place and will be monitoring this spring. Jira Creek phase two is ready to go. It should be underway in July. So that is the armament of the uh, uh, existing uh, uh, first phase. So phase one was basically digging a trench. Uh, phase two will be armoring and some work around the highway. Hart Creek is about halfway done. Uh, that work will commence as soon as possible. Some of the work can be done uh, at distance from the creek early in the spring summer. Some of it has to wait to uh, certain dates because it involves creeks and fish. So, but it will uh, be underway this spring. Uh, rural policing. We have four rural police attached to the Camor detachment. I met with two of the RCMP, the staff sergeant and uh, another member, and uh, those members are active and in place, and I want you to know that they come at a cost, a uh, tax cost. Uh, so it's uh, about $60,000 a year right now, and in three years it will ramp up to just under $200,000 a year for those uh, members to be uh, available uh, on other, they won't be out there all by themselves or collectively, they will be installed on other uh, watches or charges as, as the schedules are put together at depot. The uh, uh, project on lane grading for East Exha, there's a proposal and a public process out there. That process is still ongoing. It has not come back before council. I expect that it will soon. And uh, we will be doing upgrades to the lagoon. The upgrades to the lagoon are uh, uh, to increase capacity and to increase the level of treatment before release, particularly holding times. And uh, that uh, has been stalled for several years uh, getting to it. And we have the money. It has to be spent and we're going forward with those lagoon upgrades. It will allow more uh, uh, 
people to tie on in the hamlet and for some new develop the development that will be or might be happening in the hamlet the last thing is is the land swap i have nothing new to report on it it is a process uh going through whatever happens at the edmonton level and uh we are asking questions of that process, uh, but I haven't got anything particular to report on that uh, negotiation. Questions of the municipality. Can I ask one question, Dean, about the Jura Creek? Yes. Um, I'm assuming that, that when you say armament, there'll be no more digging uh no more disturbing the 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 bed there that uh, that already has been done i'm not aware of the details of the uh, uh phase two work uh rob so i can't uh rob uh, ralph that's okay. that's I, I can't i can't answer the question specifically i don't know if rob can either but uh, it is mostly placement of armament a uh, review of the uh uh channel has been uh done because observation is one of the ways that you can tell if you're putting the armament in the right place so that uh, uh, you know a, an engineering review has been done and I know that the designs are now reviewed and approved and the funding's approved and uh, we should be going out for contracts here shortly. Ralph, okay. if I can let you know that uh, there's going to be an information session towards the end of March with the Jura Creek plans on display. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Uh, I have one more question. If hopefully, Robert can answer it um, regarding the laneway project. Robert, do you have any updates on what's happening or where we're going with that? Uh, I'm hoping it's going to be ready for high water in June again this year. It is scheduled to be on the council agenda for March the 9th for a decision. And uh, the the plan looks similar to what was passed out to the residents or is there any substantial changes? No, it's pretty much the same as what was what uh, Mr. Luca uh, mailed out to residents. OK, thank you. Uh, I can help with that too, Ralph, because <clears throat> that came before the Streets and Roads Committee and I sit on it. So uh, the city streets and roads committee uh, is asking council to have in the detailed design or final design, which has not been done yet, uh, to pay special attention to any possibility uh, that it could have a negative impact on some of the residents. In other words, will uh, creating those ditches and swales flood somebody's property? Uh, and so the engineers have, yes, uh, yes. I've, I've heard that from a few people. So, um, and I read it also because I saw the responses to our questionnaire. Okay. And so the engineers are going to be working uh, with those residents and any other ones in the detailed design to do, uh, to mitigate those negative effects. Uh, because obviously uh, we don't want to solve one person's problem by causing one for somebody else. Yes. So, the, so we're uh, trying to mitigate it in the final design, which uh, if council uh, approves it, uh, will happen very shortly. OK, uh, thank you, Paul. I'm I'm hopeful that we will see that before we need it. Yes, that is our intention and it most certainly is mine. So we're, we're trying to expedite it, Ralph. OK, thank you. OK, other questions? Not hearing any. Uh, uh, under information, I've included an article on stars. I think it's well worth a read. Uh, we have a very large MD, 2,700 square kilometers. Some of our residents and a lot of our visitors are in remote places. And the best access we have to the best of medical care is uh, getting people already in transport under care to those major uh, hospitals in Calgary. So uh, the MD does contribute to the uh, STARS program. Uh, Banff and Camor do not. Uh, the other one that's there is uh, with regards to RCMP and fines being uh, uh, levied. Uh, a lot of tickets have been handed out. 
uh, I've been getting some uh, unappreciative emails from people that are in receipt of those uh, enforcement measures. They uh, wonder why we're being unfriendly and they don't seem to understand that uh, when a big truck is coming down Gap Hill and somebody is getting out of their car opening it and kids are moving around the car that uh, it is uh, their safety that we're concerned with. Our uh, fire department has had some uh, rescue training on ice and uh, uh, ice incidents, uh, uh, drownings and rescues and recoveries. And uh, I think that we are seeing a lot of trailhead activity, Jim, and you're not alone. There's a, a, a lot, a lot of activity going on. Some of it is connected to flash mobbing on uh, social web sites that they will put something up and all of a sudden Grotto Canyon will be the highlight of the week and the next time it's skating on Gap and the next time it's down at Jura Creek and over at Hart Creek has the same issues. So we have a, a, a problem that probably is associated with COVID, but I think we're have to gonna, gonna have to get through COVID and get to normal operations to see how much of that activity remains residual into the future. There's a good chance that a lot of it will. Uh, is there anything, oh, I have uh, Eagles, uh, Cliff Hansen. Am I uh, speaking now? Yes. Okay. On the 1st of March, we start our eagle count. And uh, just a, a, a bit of um, background. We expect maybe up to 3,000 golden eagles will pass over our heads from uh, McGill uh, Hart, McGilvery, or Kidd over to uh, Grotto. Grotto between uh, the 1st of March and the middle of April. So, um, and we do a count in the Kananaskis country at Hay Meadows. You can uh, go to uh, www.eaglewatch.ca and, uh, and get some information of where that is. I'm on duty there on the, um, tomorrow, on the 12th and on the 23rd. I'd, I would be quite happy if some of you come out for a visit. Okay. Thank you. It is well worth seeing and you need some people that can explain what's going on to make uh, sense of it and they have good scopes that you can use. So, Sorry, uh, what were the dates again? I missed that. Sorry. 12th. Well, it's this is for me. I'll, I'm on duty on the 4th, which is tomorrow, the 12th and the 23rd and the 28th of this month. And um, but there's somebody there every day from sunup to sundown, weather permitting. And um, the the 12th might be a good day because we could expect to see anywhere from 50 to 500 eagles about that time in that in, in one uh, one day. Thanks, Cliff. I'll send you a message. Okay. Okay. Uh, is Cam Davis still on the uh, uh, participant list? Yes, I, I am for right now, but I won't be for the next meeting. So. No, no, I just uh, didn't have a chance to uh, say that our uh, appreciation of your service to the committee, Cam. Uh, there was some mention of you going uh, fishing or something in the near future. Yeah, going, to, going up to the lakes and do some kayaking and fishing and sort of do all the stuff I wanted to do in the summer instead of working. Uh, we're, we're just green with envy. Yeah. <laughs> We could hardly contain your joy. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Janet, uh, again, uh, wonderful working with you, and uh, we wish you every uh, success. Thanks, Dean. Uh, appreciate that. Yes, it's uh, it's been uh, really interesting working with the BCEC and how it's evolved over the last um, bunch of years. But uh, I'll still be in the area, so um, yeah, I'll uh, I'll. I'll be around, but yeah, thanks for the kind words. Okay, good. Uh, any reason we can't adjourn the meeting, folks? I'm not ha hearing anything, so it is uh, 5.33. We've done very well for time. Congratulations.
and I wish you all a great evening. I uh, hope you enjoy some of the sunshine that's still left out there. Take care of each other. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye.